This is Risky Women Radio, a show to connect, celebrate and champion women in risk, regulation and compliance. Sharing insight and perspective from the most influential members of our global Risky Women Network on the latest developments we need to think about, the challenges we should all talk more about and the innovation we are most excited about in governance, risk and compliance. Bringing together the hundreds of senior women professionals already connected with a new emerging group of leading women and men. I'm Kimberly Cole, your Chief Risky Woman. Okay, welcome to Risky Women Radio. And today we are thrilled to have Yuko Kawai, the General Manager for Europe and the Chief Representative in London for the Bank of Japan. Welcome, Yuko. Thank you very much for having me. Okay, so Yuko Kawai is an experienced director who's worked in the banking industry, both in the private and public sectors. She began her career at uh, Kyoto University and she went on to Wharton for her MBA. She's continued on a global journey working for Chemical Bank, JP Morgan Chase, before joining the Bank of Japan, where she's held a range of roles, of which we will hear more about today. Uh, she now leads the Bank of Japan's European operation. Um, her coverage includes uh, economics and the financial industry, uh, fintech and risk management of the bank's activities. I am thrilled to have her join Risky Women Radio because she was our first speaker at the Refinitiv Tokyo Summit uh, for a Risky Women event. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me. So can you tell us a bit more about your career journey and what have been the, the highlights of your journey to date? Okay, in my career, it's uh, 30 some years all in finance. I uh, started in the private sector with an American bank operating in Tokyo, and I then moved to onto the venture company for two years, then moved to the public sector, the central bank, where I am now. Well, quite colorful looking back, I must say, uh, what which I had not been intended at all at the beginning. So when I was thinking about what I should do after my graduation from the university, I wanted something I can control. And I was looking for the job which would give me the challenges and excitement and, uh, as an ambitious and overconfident young girl, of course. But at the same time, I wanted to become an expert in something legitimate so that I would eventually feel confident and lead a stable life. That's what I thought. I also wanted to get married, uh, therefore try to avoid the job which would move my locations around, which Japanese big companies normally do. Therefore, I chose an American bank to work for uh, without uh, being able to speak to speak English, actually. So believe it or not, the satisfactory answer I could manage to make um, in the, one of the interviews, one of the job interviews was only my name. I'm not quite sure uh, why the interviewer consented uh, to hire. Since then, uh, things did not progress as I had planned. I became a roaring work rather than a stable one and moved from one assignment to the other, one place to the other. I have switched the companies only twice, but I moved around within the country frequently, uh, within, within the company frequently. It was a challenge to start a new role uh, with almost zero background knowledge or experience, but and all the stages have been the highlights to me, I would say. That is a fascinating story. I, I didn't realize that you were interviewing for an American bank and didn't speak English. That's very, very interesting. So what have been the sort of most important lessons that you've learned along the way? I had been working in the various environment with the uh, various uh, was the people with the various backgrounds. So what I had learned is how to deal with the people. Be thankful to the colleagues, bosses, families, and friends. Um, it wasn't quite easy for me, especially when I was young. And even today, I got I can easily lose my pen temper. But um, I am trying to make it back later. So be mindful about the consequence of what you do. Uh, you may be influential than you would think. Be flexible and listen to the responsible people, not necessarily the senior. I mean, senior ones in hierarchy, but uh, but the the ones who are close to you. And lastly, but uh, not the least, uh, work hard or harder. It's uh, interesting that sort of the shadow of your leadership is is a very important lesson. Who are the, some of the role models that have inspired you? 
So um, I had great uh, female bosses in my early days uh, when I was working for an American company who taught me all the lessons as I am, um, as, as I uh, they indicated. Um, I have not copied any um, the hundred percent of any of them, but um, because I had my own considerations. But the ways of my thinking have been greatly influenced by those great ladies. Oh, that's very interesting as well. And it's an interesting comparison to Japan, where we see still very few women in leadership positions. And so, therefore, I'm sure you are a role model for many. There's been a focus on womenomics, but what has your experience been of being both a woman in Japan in senior positions, but now also more globally? So I worked in Japan, uh, US, and non Japan Asia, and now in Europe, uh, physically. And any society is not perfectly, I'm not perfectly naturally embracing the diversity. So I would say the problems uh, of Japan, uh, which we're facing now, are not necessarily Japan specific. Now, having said that, there's also social norm where people's perception is a bit different uh, across the countries and uh, that make women easier or more difficult to focus on working in one country from the other. In my case, I do not have kids, uh, which made me easier to focus on my professional career, I would say. And I was lucky that I, I was lucky enough that I had not encountered any serious setbacks because of my gender. While on the contrary, very interestingly, uh, the, on the contrary, I experienced the pulls, uh, the pulls or the uh, raise up, I would say, uh, in, co- the, in consideration of raising minority. So I got the support from that. So once when uh, there, there are two occasions and once uh, when I was at the American company as an Asian female, uh, now at Bank of Japan, Bank of Japan as a female mid-career. So in both cases, I was an, um, a double minority in category. And of course, I'm not quite comfortable in attracting so much attention for non-business reasons like my minority, uh, minority feature. But I should not complain, I think, uh, because I feel I have been given great chances to prove myself. Yes, that's interesting, but obviously still proving yourself at the business level as well. But then people at least recognising that maybe to get more women into senior management, we need to take different actions. Right. Very interesting. What would you like to see maybe changed or what else do you think would help women's advancement in Japan? Currently in Japan, well, finally Japan is changing. The national and local governments are now like clearly focus on strengthening the support to raise children. This must continue, of course. And gender bias, of course, is not quite easy uh, to change, but at least uh, we can promote diversity in uh, promoting the education about diversity and diversity, I mean, what for the firstly get to know uh, where the diversity is, and um, that that will like uh, bring us to the right direction. So, I'd say like in Japan, um, overall, I mean, the good initiatives are being made and we are moving into the right direction. And once we exceed uh, the tipping point of the population, the minority who are uh, who are active in the society, I think we'll get there. Just a quick break in the show. If you would like to be a sponsor of our podcast and help celebrate the many fabulous femmes in governance, risk and compliance, please get in touch with Risky Women. You can contact us via our website at www.riskywomen.org. Thanks for listening and being part of Risky Women Radio. Now a word from one of our sponsors, Refinitiv. Already trusted by customers worldwide, Refinitiv provides the data, technologies, and expertise that help shape the way financial markets work. Help protect your business from financial crime and reduce risk with WorldCheck. WorldCheck delivers trusted risk intelligence to help meet your regulatory obligations and make informed decisions. Refinitiv. Data is just the beginning. So can you tell us a bit more about your role now and what are your key responsibilities? Sure. So my current title is a general manager for Europe. Uh, but in fact, what they, my coverage includes uh, Middle East and Africa as well. So it's Europe, Middle East and Africa. I do research on economic development, financial markets and industry, and also the front edge developments such as fintechs or sustainable finance. Relationship management uh, with the outside counterparts is an important pillar of my job. 
And uh, so is the management of the three offices under me. That's uh, the London, Paris, and Frankfurt. This is the very first time for me to live in Europe or uh, to even focus in Europe. Uh, while my career had been reasonably international, um, I'd never come to this part of the world, which is full of historical, historical nuances, details, and complexity. And that, this is a splendid place to gain the understanding and the respect for the diversity. That's very interesting and obviously a very broad role. So let's get into even more about your global responsibility and, and, and how you've really developed this global career. You've worked across a range of functions, everything from FX to risk. You led the FinTech Centre yes. in Bank of Japan. Um, can you tell us a bit more about the, the FinTech Centre sure. itself and why it was established? Okay. So uh, just prior to coming to London that uh, a year ago, that was a year ago, um, the, I was heading so-called FinTech Center at the Bank of Japan. Uh, the FinTech Center is a new group, a new um, the division at Bank of Japan. And the purpose of the establishment of that center is very well summarized in the governor's speech, uh, which is printed on our website. So let me just quote some of, some of the sentences. The bank aims to reinforce its efforts in which developments of the fintech will contribute to enhancing financial services. The bank will also endeavor to play an active role as a catalyst for the promoting interaction among financial practices and innovative product technologies. The center will serve as a hub for such interaction. End of the quote. So, in my words, the central bank, uh, not only Bank of Japan, um, by sitting at the heart of the financial system, always wants to do things to improve the system, and the fintech is one avenue. That's uh, interesting, and obviously there's a lot of uh, focus across the industry in general on fintech, so it's, it's interesting to see how all elements of the industry yes. are, are looking at what's the innovation, yes. and I, I like that sort of catalyst of how they're driving change. Yeah. So, I mean, just generally from your experience, what are some of the most exciting or interesting things that you're seeing from a, a fintech perspective? There are too many interesting developments, <laughs> so it's really hard to choose one or two. But let me say, let me pick up on, uh, let me pick up like, at least one or two. Okay, so one of them is, of course, the cross-border, cross-segment uh, coordination of the payments by sharing broader range of information. Well, they typically it's um, trade finance using blockchain technology. I would not say the current version of blockchain technology is matured enough to embed large-scale practical applications. However, the core concepts of the shared ledger and or the irrevocable timestamps will certainly benefit in modifying the existing incumbent system. So we may not need to directly apply the blockchain technology per se by using blockchain codes, but uh, the concepts of blockchain by itself can change the, uh, the current setup and can make the current setup, the payment system or the settlement system or whatever, uh, much more efficient and much more reliable. The other one I can think of is the customization and or the aggregation of the financial services and non-financial services to, especially to the retail, in the retail sector, to the individual in individuals and or to the very small and small organizations. So the most famous example, this is the mobile phone service platform offered in China, uh, which embeds like hundreds of applications to individuals, just like one touch of the smartphone, uh, the, the smartphone, the platform. So there are many variations of this concept which should greatly improve the economic and social efficiency in many countries. Yeah, interesting because both at the consumer end as well as actually for the, the banks and the industry yes. overall. So, yeah, it's a fascinating area. Yeah. Um, and I'm hoping to do a lot more focus uh, this season on RegTech and FinTech. So right. thank you for that overview. I mean, given the rise of technology, given the changes, what do you think is going to be the impact of that on the financial industry? Well, changes are already happening uh, with the rise of the fintech. And um, it's not really like, a, well, you may say that when there are so many like applications on the smartphone which are usable by the individuals or by the corporations, but it's 
More importantly, I think at the core of the thinking is changing uh, in the finance industry. So, uh, for example, like many banks are now claiming themselves to be the customer oriented, agile, open and unprejudiced. Well, it's not only the private sector banks, but central banks and governments are trying to change as well. So, uh, technically, the financial services will become more customized and more integrated with non-financial services, possibly leading to the creation of service platforms, as I mentioned in China's case, or like broader corporations beyond industry silos or the country borders. Some regulators are also moving forward to promote the competition for better services to the people. Hardware-wise, technology-wise, a smartphone was an absolute game changer, and AIs and the clouds follow. But most important thing is not how to use these technologies, as I said, rather why you want to use these technologies. And finance industry must and will transform itself into, finally, the customer-oriented industry focusing on consumer pain points. Interesting. Um, I I think, you know, customer trust is another sort of key element around so the the service experience, but also building the, or maybe rebuilding the trust after the global financial crisis. Yes. Um, and so given your experience across the globe, because you've now worked uh, across in multiple regions and also for companies mm-hmm. from multiple regions, mm-hmm. how does it compare and what sort of knowledge or learnings have you gained through the experiences? In terms of uh, the difference uh, and gaps uh, across the regions, uh, the notable thing is that demography plays a very, very important role. It isn't a secret at all that the Asia will gain its significance by the number of the people to be followed by Africa someday. On the other hand, uh, the uh, Japan is at the front edge, uh, but the many other Asian countries will suffer from the aging population in short period of time. Uh, Japan is already suffering. Uh, the other aspect is that the infrastructure, like unstructured, in- intangible infrastructure, like such as the underdeveloped banking sector, is no more as important as before um, because uh, technology can leapfrog. So where there is no, where is insufficient banking system, the mobile phone payment system can replace it. On the other hand, the tangible infrastructures such as transportation or so the mobile communication networks do still matter. Looking at across the regions, I think I'm we need to think about what is the necessity uh, for the uh, the economy to develop or the economy to develop, and uh, they could be different from before. And uh, we should always start. I'm mean, start the analysis with the data, and based on the data, is my strong belief in order to understand the similarities and differences. Then you need to ask for the experts' opinions in the region, the qualitative analysis, whatever. But uh, always you really need to think uh, think, um, think from the data as well. As from the so when you look around the world, what are the top issues that you think that risk professionals really need to have on their list to monitor and that their businesses need to be thinking about how to manage? Um, as I said, data analytics. I mean, data analysis uh, is an absolute necessity and it's even more important than before. And given the enormous amount of data we have in our hands and our exposure to many unstructured data as well as structural numerical data, uh, we really, really need to I mean, fully utilize the modern technologies, uh, including machine learning and also other types of like uh, traditional data, uh, data analytics skills. So even though I'm not, I'm, I'm not myself as, um, as a specialist, I mean, as a technically trained uh, data scientist, I think we all need to think as the data scientists do. And even though I may not need to be able to, I'm like, uh, to write calls by myself, I really need to understand how the data analysis is being done and how it can be used by myself. Mm. Yes, it's interesting the number of businesses now that you see hiring data scientists yes, exactly. and how, how crucial that's becoming. Yep. Okay, our next um, section is our rants and revelations. So what is the top piece of advice that you have been given that's really helped you in your career? Be mindful to others. Go back to the principles when in doubt. Excellent. 
And what's your rant? So if you were the ruler of the of the world for the day, what what would you wave your magic wand and change? Eliminate wars. That's a good one. So make the peace as the absolute norm in everybody's mind. That's my ambition. That's a very, very good ambition. Okay, our rapid fire round. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Ready? Yes. <laughs> One word to describe the world of governance, risk, and compliance. Discipline. Discipline. Yes. Mm. And your cure for the cost of compliance or the wave of regulatory change. But very uh, the difficult one. I would say coordination, information sharing. And are you optimistic, pessimistic, or neutral for your outlook outlook for the year ahead? Optimistic, uh, in the sense that world will never collapse tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> and a bit more fun now. Uh, a book that you would recommend that everyone should read? I would say ni- 1984 by George Orwell. Very interesting. Um, something to watch. Um, I'm not a TV watcher. I mean, if I were asked for movies there are too many but i would vote for maybe like star wars uh, harry potter types and that's um that's a great example of the uh, the great ux to the customer very true and what's your favorite podcast (laughs) okay (laughs) this is very true i'm necessarily true the risky women or ted type of uh the podcasts always inspire me and also for my fun part and fun part of my life, uh, the, I always use the podcast for the language learning. So those are the two of my favorite categories, but I'm not like, spending enough, uh, the enough time as, uh, as much as I want to on those two categories and more so, like, more, more listening to like news podcasts. Uh, trying, I mean, it's just a part of my business, but the favorite ones are the, the, the first two categories. Well, I thank you very much. Uh, I love a podcast myself and I'm very happy that you are a Risky Woman and you listen to Risky Women. So thank you very much, Yuko Kawa, for joining us today and it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you. This episode is brought to you by our founding sponsor, Refinitiv. Refinitiv serves more than 40,000 institutions in over 190 countries. Refinitiv provides information, insights, and technology that drive innovation and performance in global financial markets. Refinitiv enables the financial community to trade smarter and faster, overcome regulatory challenges, and scale intelligently. Thank you for listening to this exciting episode of Rescue Women Radio to connect, champion, and celebrate women in risk regulation and compliance. I'm Kimberly Cole, based in Hong Kong. For more information on the Risky Women Global Network, head to our website in the episode notes and please be a part of the ongoing conversation by subscribing to this podcast, connecting with us at Risky Women on Twitter, or even reaching out to me directly by email.